And now for a discussion on how brands can use content to activate their likes and followers so they don't end up with stuck at the like kind of area. Uh, please welcome Krista Carone, Corp Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer of Xerox, Diego Scotti, Chief Marketing Officer of J. Crew, Michael Lazaro, CEO and co-founder of Buddy Media, with conversations led by Adam Ostro, Executive Editor of Mash a Bowl. In the house, y'all. Come on, give it up. Okay. Have fun, y'all. Have a good time. Thanks, everybody. Diego, did you Hi. dress these two? What, sorry? Did you dress these two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are like, <laughs> unfortunately, they're not wearing J. Crew, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> very Next spring, time. Uh, very springy. Um, so anyways, our panel today is called Stuck at the Like, and what we're going to be talking about is essentially how brands, uh, the folks in here included, are creating content and making that part of their advertising mix. So really just to start things out, I'd love for each of you to talk a little bit, well, at least, the, at least the two of you at the end, about how your brands are leveraging content now. What type of content are you creating and how are you distributing it? So uh, I'm representing B2B brands today. I, mean, I hope there's somebody else out there, but uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of, of this conversation because often B2B isn't included in some of these broader conversations and often perceive that we can't do things that are quite as fun as what um, you know, as my colleagues here are doing. Xerox right now is in the middle of a massive transformation, and I don't use that word lightly. I know it's a real popular business buzzword, and we always say we're not just talking about transforming the company, we're actually doing it. Um, and while many of you may be familiar with Xerox in the printer and copier space, uh, that's actually less than half of our revenue right now, and the company is a very significant player in business services not doing very sexy things, but behind the scenes making sure that those sexy and innovative things that we depend on every day are happening. Um, my favorite example is Easy Pass. I don't know how many of you can live without Easy Pass these days, especially if you live in the metro New York area. But Xerox is the company that actually processes all of those Easy Pass transactions. So a great example of how we're behind the scenes. And I say that because that's what our content needs to be all about right now, um, providing unexpected yet really relevant examples of why Xerox exists in this world today. And our content is very much focused on putting Xerox in those unexpected places that forces you to kind of question your current belief of Xerox and want to learn a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And we'll see a piece of that later on. Yep. Uh, Diego. Uh, well, for, for us, first of all, thank you for having us. But for us, the, the discussion about content is, is almost like an embarrassment of riches because um, th this company, and I've been in this company now for six months, so I, I, I can't take a lot of credit for, for uh, what Mickey Drexler and, and Jenna Lyons have done uh, for years. Um, but, but it's all built around content and the idea that, that, that the product is, is actually the, the, the content. And, and, and I, was, I was joking with some people before because uh, when we talk about content, we talk about creating stories that our customers are going to enjoy and engage with, no matter which channel um, uh, we're in. And a good example, I, I brought our, our very low file um, um, catalog that we just renamed Style Guide. Uh, because we discovered that our customers were using it as a as a magazine, actually, uh, you know, tearing the pages of the of the catalog, like you know, coming to the store with the looks that they wanted us to um, uh, help them buy. Um, so now it's becoming more of a magazine that we're only just using in, in the print space, but also taking into the digital space. Uh, the, the the interesting point, and I, and I think this is a, a call out for all of us, is that content costs money. Right. I think there is this um, perception in the in the world that uh, you know it's easy to create good content that people will in engage with, with just having a camera in front of you or or in a in a very cheap way. Well, if you're gonna do it right, you're gonna need to invest on on, on it. And I think that's something that uh, from the get go we all need to understand very clearly. And also the authority, you know, play on these areas where you are going to have authority. Mm -hmm. And Mike, your company Buddy Media helps brands create content and conversation every day, primarily on Facebook. What are the big things you're seeing right now in, in, in trends revolving around content and brands? So I think every company realizes that content is the single best way to connect with consumers. That's why we're here at the new front. The world goes around because of content. Without content, the world sucks. And so we're all there 
philosophically, and I think the focus that we have is how do you create content at very large organizations? How do you distribute that content at scale? How do you track how that content is spreading, whether you're publishing it to free channels like your website or you know, Facebook pages or Twitter or YouTube pages, or you're paying for distribution? And it's really an organizational issue. You know, J. Crew has always been a publisher, both print, online, you know, as new media come up, they're there. For other companies who aren't used to creating content and thinking like a publisher, it's very hard. And so the only thing we're focused on at Buddy Media is basically how do we make it easy inside an organization to create content, optimize that content, and repeat it to drive business results again and again across 200 brands globally, you know, if you're a company, you know, like Unilever or, you know, Starwood with a thousand hotels, like how do you create content, you know, for all the hotels and get it out? And, um, and that's what we're focused on. Mm -hmm. and, and Diego, you mentioned this need to invest. It's not a small investment to create co great content. So what are we talking about? I mean, what are the numbers either in terms of dollars or percentage of your advertising mix? I mean, give us some guidance as to what you mean by big investment. Well, well t t today, I mean, we, we still want to make sure that the content gets to the hands of the, the, the people that um, uh, need to con you know, consume it. But uh, f f for us, the, the photo shoots that go into creating the catalog or, or the, the next catalog, the June catalog, for example, is all shoot, shot in, in Bali um, because we wanted to tell the story, the amazing cultural background of this of this country and and uh, and that's what we're doing you know I, I think the point about about engagement and my point about investing in content is that we need to if, if we want people to engage with the content it needs to be something of value you know we, we have so many cases in which I, I think even we are confronted with the idea of is this is this a gimmick it's gonna be a gimmick just to get people tricked into uh, interacting with our brand or it's gonna give them you know some some value I mean we did some testing with um, content that for us is not very expensive, but it's about, um, you know, we did this experiment with our um, men's stylists uh, to, to start asking our customers every week to just tell us what are the questions that they want answered in terms of how to dress. And we're now receiving 1,500 of these questions every week, different people that just engage with us every week uh, through email, through Facebook, through other channels, uh, because they want help. You know, it, it, that to me is a great example of something that it might not be very expensive, but it, it, adds, it adds value. And that to me needs to be the threshold that we all put in terms of uh, the content and the quality of what we produce. Right. Uh, Mike, how about from, from your perspective, I mean, what are brands investing? What's the level of investment they're making? So there's two types of content. There's content you already have. And I think what we learned is when Facebook launched their timeline, a lot of content that you didn't really think of like consumer content all of a sudden became content. So the picture of the first Burberry store in like 18 whatever, like 60, that was one of the most engaging posts that they'd made. Um, and it actually lives on this one beautiful page, which is their Facebook timeline. So it's what is the content you have that you can actually, doesn't cost anything, that your, will connect you to your customers and potential customers. And then it's how do you create content that people will engage with? And I think we're seeing a trend that, you know, the border between content and ad is going away. It's just content, right? So it's no longer, I mean, TV, it's obviously you create a, you know, a TV show and someone's creating an ad and you're inserting it into the TV show. Facebook, you post to Facebook and then you buy that as an ad. Twitter, you're posting to Twitter, you're tweeting and then you're promoting that tweet. And I think that that's a really powerful movement where it's gonna be a, not about what you wanna say, it's gonna be about how people engage with it. It's no longer about being the quarterback and just throwing, it's about how the consumers catch it as the receiver and run with it. And using consumer engagement to drive your messaging and not just a few people in a boardroom. Right, well there's, there's the organic engagement, but you just mentioned the idea of also paying for additional distribution on Facebook and Twitter. What role does that play in the content you're creating and distributing it out there, are you guys actively, you know, paying for promoted tweets or sponsored stories? Yeah, so we've just started experimenting with some promoted tweets in the last, actually just in the last couple of weeks. Um, we've had some initial negative reaction from uh, 
more established clients or some followers who are saying, hey, you've done a good job organically. Do you really need to go this route? And then we've had, we've had some nice upticks in, in some of the, um, you know, the, the metrics that we've been following in this space. So for us, we're experimenting. I'm not sure that the answer is really clear on whether or not it works for our campaigns and for our messaging and what we're trying to build from a brand perspective. But I, you know, right now we're all experimenting, right? These, these are new frontiers and we have to figure out what is the definition of success each time that we try. And that definition of success varies yeah. with every experiment. Well, well, how about you, Mike? I mean, the definition of success, I'm sure when clients come to Buddy, you have to provide them some sort of metrics on what the results of their campaigns are. What, how do you guys define it? Well, I think that the clients that have gotten it right with us, at least, at scale, so those are clients like Ford that has you know, empowered their dealers and every brand and every country to really jump in. Those are clients who didn't let ROI get in the way. Like, what's the ROI of connecting with 7 billion people on the face of the earth? It's pretty high if you get it right. Now, what we do know is these platforms are going to get more expensive. So it once cost 10 cents to buy like hotel, Vegas hotel room clicks on Google. It's now $10 a click. So the cost of all this is going to get more expensive. We can quantify lower funnel stuff. So what's the revenue per share on Facebook, the revenue per tweet, the revenue per Google Plus, whatever they call that. Um, and so, you know, but I look at that as not fundamentally connecting with consumers in a meaningful way. Like, you know, I hear over and over again, Facebook's not for B2B marketers, Facebook's not for this, Twitter's not for this. But how cool is it that Xerox is processing all of this data related to like your car driving through? Like, how does it even work? Like, you drive through and it's like, easy pass, got it. Like, that's crazy that that happens. And if I was Xerox, I'd be like, let's do like the live ticker of how many transactions and let's tell that story because the story that people are used to with Xerox is kind of like, you make printers, printers are going away. I'm sorry. Right. And <laughs> I, do, I do think though that there is, there is an over-reliance on, 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 or over-focused on, on, on metrics. And, and, in, and in my opinion, what's happening is that that over-reliance is driving uh, the, the reduction in quality of the content because a lot of companies uh, just, just want to have it cheaper because they need it scale, they don't have a lot of money, or you have this like, side of the budget that is kind of like to experiment with content. Uh, so the question is, how, how do you drive it to, to be as, as inexpensive as, as possible? And then you end up in, in, in the road of like, well, can we create some you know, user-generated uh, gimmick to try to, to get our customers to, uh, uh, to engage? We, we, we try to stay away from that, and I, and I think, you know, um, and you never say never, you know, but, but I think part of, like, at least what we try to uh, put in everything that we do is uh, integrity and, and authenticity, you know. So for me, uh, in, in terms of when I talk about marketing, if, if we put so much effort in, in the, the, the quality of the materials or the seams or what we, uh, what we, you know, the way we make our clothes, the same thing is to happen for marketing in terms of authenticity. Mm -hmm. And Krista, I think this, the title of this panel, Stuck at the Like, is really applicable to you, because unlike a lot of campaigns, you're not concerned so much with a, a, accumulating millions of followers or fans. You're, you're looking for a very specific type of customer, someone that's going to spend six, seven figures with you guys. How does B2B you know, function in Facebook? Is Facebook important to you guys? So what we've come to appreciate in how we're defining and every day redefining our social strategy is uh, not becoming overly dependent on what's the popular platform of the day, but understanding where our key stakeholders, our key prospects are influenced by information. So it's easy to always talk about Facebook, right? But I know that the CIOs of major corporations are not going to be making a billion dollar, five year outsourcing contract deal based on their connection with Xerox over Facebook. Um, however, we also employ 140,000 people. We're always recruiting. And I know that Facebook has a lot of influence in encouraging people to look at Xerox as a workplace. So what we've had to start to do 
is be more disciplined in curating content that is based on the platform and is based on the stakeholder who we're trying to reach. So B2B is so much more targeted than traditional consumer companies. And a lot of what I'm doing is working with our marketing community to say, is Pinterest really where you want to go right now? Because I'm pretty sure the head of the hospital system in California who's about to make this major deal is not going to pay attention to what we're doing on Pinterest. But have you looked at ways that we have a point of view on what's happening in healthcare reform? And are we really focusing our content, our resources, our investments in those areas? And, and, and you've initiated some programs to get Xerox employees to really become kind of brand ambassadors on social networks yeah. as well. And I, to speak about that a little bit, I think it's interesting. Sure. So, you know, er, early on, uh, interestingly enough, as a technology company, we did not have our people embracing social media as much as you would have assumed. And part of that is because we're very much a per permission-based culture. Uh, very, very well behaved. And so our employers were waiting to feel empowered that they could use their own social media channels to be spokespeople for the company. It's also an incredibly well tenured organization and our employees tend to be brand loyalists. So once you empower them, they will do the right thing. Um, we've been very inspired by that. So instead of issuing social media policies, we, um, we started talking about some social media guidelines and more providing that permission. It was not a negative approach. It was, we want you to become spokespeople for us. So now, before we're about to launch a major product, um, we'll invite our employees in and give them a sneak peek about what we might launch, and we'll provide them with the content they need, and we'll say, go ahead and be our spokespeople. Mm -hmm. Never been done before. It makes the legal folks a little bit nervous, but we also have not had a single instance where our employees have disappointed us. So they're part of our non-disclosure process, just like we would do with industry analysts and others, because we know that they can have a really impactful voice and be ad advocates mm -hmm. for the company. Company. Right. And yeah. Diego, you're, you're a very visual brand. I mean, how do you encourage your employees to, to share that spirit with the community at large, or do you do that? Well, we, we, um, we a little bit like a year ago, we launched a, a, an experiment that now has grown a, dramatically, which is our blog. Um, and and, and, and the, one of the, the, the key reasons to be on the blog is, was to show the behind the scenes of, of J. Crew, both in terms of what happens in in, in headquarters and, and the design process, but also in the way we make our products, et cetera. And that's been a tremendous opportunity for employees to get, to get involved because, I mean, we, we believe in, in that there needs to be a, a, an editorial eye uh, towards everything that we do. And like you said, we are a very visual brand, so uh, the, the creative director is very busy from that perspective. Um, but it's been a, a terrific opportunity for employees to get involved and participate from everything that they appreciate, what is, which, which is something that connects with the brand, uh, but also in terms of telling the stories about the brand. And, um, uh, and, and, and video is another area that uh, um, for, for us has been very uh, interesting in terms of experimenting because a lot of the stories that we want to tell are really stories that are not flat, that, that we want it to be beyond the, the pho photography or, or something that is in, a, in, in just a, in a magazine. Um, and I think we have one of the examples of yeah. what we did that, that I think is interesting. For us, it was very interesting because we're, we're trying, at the center of the content that we develop is always the story. And, and the story for us, and that's what I was talking about, the, 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 for us there's no difference between content and product. The product is the content. We, we, uh, we created these videos um, uh, last year that were about uh, telling the, the story of quality of uh, what we do. And uh, I just want to show you this clip that is about us going to Italy and uh, finding out how we make the shoes. widest and then like a quarter inch smaller quarter we come to okay. Italy to get shoes made because I don't really think you can find the level of expertise and detail and quality that you find here the nuance in terms of the way that they see the shape and what they create right out of the bat is just is beautiful okay. it's kind of like a gold mine down there <laughs> hey, this one this is the color I'm loving the minty green oh, oh my god 
if you did multi-stress with this, are you starting to sketch with that? Like, could we do a bunch of different colors? Workers here are sons of guys that have worked here in 50, 60 years. So there is a big history about shoes. So you, 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 you breathe the shoes around here. It's in the blood. Well, I think this. How about the midget green for this part? Even more curve. Here, just making sure that this is cut out. It seems like it's magic, and in the end, you realize like it's totally human. It's so cool. So, so uh, just to, 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 to finish, I, th I think to me, th this discussion about um, the discussion to me is about content distribution, and then the difference between good content and BS content, because th that, that's, the, that's the reality. I think the, 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 uh, uh, doing BS, BS content is really easy. Right. Well, w with a piece like that, how do you measure, uh, how do you measure the impact? What is... For, for, for us, it was all about a, the, the awareness of our story. When we had, and I don't know if, uh, I think it comes after that, 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 that scenes that we see, but when we had a guy that is making the shoes, um, talking about the, the care that they put on, on, on making them. Uh, and he also says, oh, you see, in here we make the Prada shoes, in here we make the Gucci shoes, and in here we make the J. Crew shoes. Well, for us that's important, you know, because uh, we, we're making something that has a lot of integrity uh, and that uh, we want to make sure that as many people as possible in the world can enjoy them. That's our mission, you know, mm -hmm. so. Now, Krista, your brand's trying to tell a different kind of story, and I know you have uh, a piece of content that you published on YouTube, I think, just a week ago. It's uh, performed fairly well. I think it has 150,000 uh, views already. Uh, set that one up for a little bit and tell us what you're trying to do. Sure. So, like I, when I started off, we're in this, you know, big transformation of the company and trying to convince all of you who might already have a firm perception of the Xerox brand that we stand for so much more. Um, we've done a tremendous amount of research in this area. We, we've got all the market insights and we felt like our marketing was working too hard against the entrenched brand perceptions and we said we actually need to embrace it. We know that Xerox is synonymous with copying in many people's minds, and that's okay. It's part of our heritage that we're actually exceptionally proud of, and as a result of that, we are in 160 countries. We have tremendous brand awareness in all of those countries, and I wouldn't trade that for the world, but I would like you to stretch your mind a little bit and um, not just be aware of our company in the copying and printing space, but give us some credit in these other areas. So we decided to produce a bit of content that would help with that belief um, element that we're going after. We want you to believe us that our brand can move from what you traditionally know us for into this broader space. And to get you to believe, we wanted to celebrate our heritage a little bit and um, pay homage to the fact that it all started with printing and it's a big piece of who we are, but look at how much that's brought us forward in this world. So we can run, uh, run this video and by the way, we're not looking for any metrics around it. This is just um, for you to get to start believing in the new Xerox. There's this idea called progress. It says that when technology advances, so does humanity. We started Xerox to help that along by making information easier to share. Only the more progress the world made, the more complicated it became. We thought, instead of just drowning in this ocean of data and technology, why not use it to make life simple again? So we find ways to channel it all into simple streams of data so you can focus on only the information you need and share it seamlessly. When the boom in e-commerce led to a boom in e-fraud, we invented anti-counterfeit packaging to make sure that the medicine you ordered is the medicine you get. And when we noticed that natural disasters were soon followed by communications disasters, we created instant pop-up call centers to help bring calm and stability to where it's needed most. When you can help doctors virtually monitor all their patients at once and manage their treatment electronically, what you're really doing is helping people get better and stay better. When you install traffic cameras on school buses, you're not just giving the driver one less thing to worry about. You're keeping kids safe. When you create a technology that makes paying for public transportation effortless, 
you're actually reducing the number of cars on the road and making the air easier to breathe. We came up with these solutions for the same reason we started this company more than half a century ago, to make the world simpler so you can focus on what really matters. These simple answers to complicated problems are our business. We call it real business, but most people, they just call it progress. What I love about this video is I have salespeople from around the world who are calling to say thank you because it's not so much about the views on YouTube. It's something that starts a conversation that they can have with clients and prospects. So this is content that becomes so rich because we can distribute it across not just the mediums that we all think about, but when you sell through a direct sales force, you have to influence those individuals and give them an opportunity to knock on doors and start the conversation. So the whole point of this video was to be that conversation starter. And to me, that's the power of really good creative and really good content. Mm -hmm. So we just saw two pieces of content created by your brands in-house. One big trend uh, that we've been talking about and, and seeing a lot of this week has been the idea of brands that are um, working with publishers to create content. Is that something that you guys are, are looking at and doing? So we are. Uh, we've done, uh, actually, we've got some work out this week with Wired, uh, Wired Magazine, the good old-fashioned print, um, where we worked with them on developing, they developed the content around what we would call some real business stories and behind-the-scenes stories on how people simplify the ways that work gets done. And then we surrounded that with our advertising and our campaign. But we did have some say um, in not, not the actual editorial, but in the thematic of the editorial and look to surround that with the Xerox messaging. And that's been successful for us. And we also are looking to do that in some digital plays as well. And I know you guys do that really well as too. So Yeah, no, supported content's become a, a big driver of our business. We're creating programs for dozens of brands. Uh, for GE, for example, we do a series called World at Work, where we're essentially looking at uh, social entrepreneurs, so telling their story, something that's very in, in alignment with what GE is doing uh, in terms of their you know, Im uh, imagination campaign. Yeah. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, well actually I want to continue on that theme a little bit with you Mike, because you work so much with big brands every day, and I'm curious what types of, what type of projects are they coming to you, what are the content challenges they're looking for you to solve? So most of the content that brands are going to publish at least the brands that we work with, they don't create. They're in a, the business of curating and taking content that's already been created either by their teams or you know, by publishers and sharing it with their communities. So a big part of social marketing is becoming the resource for fashion, for you know, how do you grow your business at scale globally, how do you solve problems. Um, and I think that that's a huge trend, curate, not create. The content that's being created is you know, I, uh, two buckets in terms of the marketing content. There's micro content, which you know, photos and videos will get 75% higher engagement on you know, at least Facebook. You know, Twitter is just status updates. So you know, doubling down on kind of tons of photos, videos, figure out what work. And then kind of what I look at like hero pieces like we just saw, which um, really unite the brand. You know, as I said earlier, content drives connections. It powers connections. And those are, as a B2B marketer, you know, Buddy Media, we sell a product to other businesses, but there really is no B2B in it. It's just people at Buddy Media selling to people at Ford. You know, so it's people selling to people. And content is what you know, it's about. I think you have to open yourself up. You know, how many of you in the room have friends who are incredibly good looking and perfect kids and perfect jobs? Like, raise your hand. None, because we hate those people. <laughs> okay? They're awful, awful people who make us feel awful. Um, we, like flaw we like flaws in our friends. We like flaws in our businesses. We hate phonies. And so I think opening up yourself as a business and the soul of the business to the world 
and showing that you have flaws is actually a great thing and connects you more than just standing at the corner saying, we're awesome, we're awesome, we're awesome. Yeah. You mentioned curation. And this is a big trend that a lot of people in the media world are, are talking about right now. Certainly at Mashable, we're starting to, to get into curation a little bit. How does it impact a, a brand like J.Crew or Xerox? I mean, are you guys finding content that you think is of interest to your community and sharing it out there that's not created by J.Crew or not created by Xerox? What, what we found with, with our customers is that they, they, they trust and they want the, the point of view of, of J.Crew. And, and that happens on, on the clothes as well as in, in the bigger context of, 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 cult, of the culture, you know? And, and so, so the, the example that I was mentioning about the globe is, the, the blog is very interesting because one of the, uh, the most successful features uh, of, of, the, of the blog that we also distribute across, across channels is our, our playlist. So, so every week there is a list of 10 uh, songs that you can download from, from iTunes um, that is curated by the, the people at J. Crew. And, and, and it's terrific because people want to know and they want to enjoy the same things that we enjoy and we, and we appreciate. So we're moving more and more towards the, the notion of um, helping people experience cultures through the point of view of, of, of J. Crew, and it's, and it's working. I, I tend to, for us, I tend to believe that um, in order for this brand and any brand to be successful, the, the, the component of content creation needs to be huge. And I, you know, I had the, the privilege of working at, at, at Vogue magazine for a, a few years before, before here, and many, many clients were coming to us to say, um, can you help us build content? Because either what I do is not good, or I don't know how to do it. I don't have the, the skill set to do it. Um, so, so I know that it's not easy, but taking maybe a, a part of your group or take th some of your budget to, to bring it inside, to create that voice, and that con I think is, is critical. Because there's no other way that you can be successful at talking to consumers uh, in, this, in this area if, if there's not a, cre a clear voice. And nobody knows better than uh, yourself. Sure. Yeah, I couldn't agree with that more. I think I'm going to take a practical approach to this. This is really, really hard to do. So we talk, we're talking a lot about content curation within our company, and we have a very diverse and decentralized marketing community in over 160 countries. So one of my challenges right now is we're already producing a heck of a lot of content, and maybe 5% of it is good. <laughs> You know, so we have, we have a quality issue because so many people have access to and, and good or bad um, are creating a lot of content. So our curation approach internally is do we have a good understanding of the inventory of content that's being produced? Um, are we able to maintain the quality of it because we're actually a, um, not a branded house but a house of, you know, of, of many brands? And then how do I operationalize this now? So I've got a massive amount of content that needs to be deployed across a never-ending sea of medium to different stakeholders. Uh, and strategically, everyone nods their head and says, yes, yes, yes. But I must say, for agency folks in the room, this is a challenge that we've put out to our agency, is help us operationalize this. Because we all know what we should be doing. But this is hard work, and it's only getting tougher right. every day. And one big challenge, I think, uh, that's worth talking about a little bit, is you mentioned Xerox is in 160 countries. What's your approach to social in these other markets around the world? Yep. So, um, this is where having actually more of a decentralized approach, I think, has been helpful in, in us scaling our social presence. So we do allow each country to develop their own social strategy. Again, we have a centralized approach to guidelines, and we have a hub-and-spoke model in how we manage social. So I've got somebody on our team who I'd say is the company's number one social coach and guru, and he's almost our in-house consultant, um, but every country and every line of business is empowered to develop their own social strategy. So if you look, um, you, know, you would find that we have dozens of Facebook pages. We have Xerox of Mexico. We have Xerox of Argentina. We're monitoring all of them centrally. We just closed down one because there wasn't enough activity and we weren't happy with how it was being managed. But we have taken a more democratic approach to 
we can't manage social, so um, and we want it to be local, we want it to be personal, and we let um, our brand ambassadors in each of the countries mm -hmm. do that on their own. Diego, how's J. Crew uh, handling that challenge? Well, we're not a global company yet, yeah. but uh, so that's pretty easy for. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 it's interesting because we are we're going through the process now of setting up the, the business model for for running an internet or a global business uh, and, and, and you know, having experienced a lot of the, the, the issues that you mentioned from uh, previous lives, it's not, an easy, it's not an easy task because it gets very decentralized, uh, very easy. You know? I, 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 I think that uh, to me overall this whole, this whole discussion about, about content, although it's not easy, and I agree with you, it's, it's difficult to, to create this great content, I think the issue is, is about um, how do you, that there needs to be a certain amount of freedom and, and, and be comfortable with the idea of waste. We say no many, many times to a lot of pieces of content that we developed, and then it doesn't turn out how we thought it was going to be, or it's not of the quality or the, or the clarity that we want it to be. So, but, but, but I think we, we, we have a management that is very uh, cool with the idea that, yeah, we might waste a few uh, pennies here or there in terms of trying to get to the quality that we want, you know? Mm -hmm. Mike, did you have something you wanted to say on that thought? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> you look like you're about to talk. Uh, one other thing I wanted to, to bring up was the idea of user-generated content and how that plays into your brand strategy, either from a curation standpoint or something that you're actively encouraging using your various distribution channels. J. Crew certainly um, is a, a brand where people are just organically sharing stuff about you know, their experience with the brand. Is that something you guys are looking at? Uh, yeah, we are, and we are, and we're not. I mean, the, the uh, we're fortunate because we're in a category that people, you know, are engaged and they want to be engaged. In, in fact, to be honest, I mean, there are there are 13 blogs and websites out there that are about the about J Crew. It's, it's fascinating because they are about J Crew, but not written by J Crew or, or produced by J Crew. In fact, there is a, a blog that is called Vogue Archives. So this this person that scans the catalog every month and put them up there so people can enjoy them. You know, that's amazing level of engagement. We, we haven't figured out how to leverage that energy. You know, maybe we need to go with my buddy here and talk to him, but, <laughs> it, but, but I think it's part, it's part of the, 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 what we haven't figured out, that, that energy. And also in terms of the user generating content is that we know that there is a lot of discussion about the brand out there and that we need to participate on that. Um, but we're not very... Um, I don't know, we're, not, we're not, not terribly open to the idea of uh, having a lot of people just uh, posting a lot of, uh, you know, photos about our product that, you know, we might not uh, appreciate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Mike, question for you. I mean, in wrapping up here, you have a lot of insight in, into trends. You represent a ton of brands. Uh, what's next? What are the next big things that people in this room need to be thinking about for the next few years in terms of content? So... I think what we just witnessed with Kony 2012 is going to be corporatized, and I think we're moving from building kind of our social graphs and um, you know, our content to building our human graphs. How do we build a network of connections all over the world that we can activate at any time? And I think that a lot of the work I'm seeing done on the cause marketing side, you know, Warby Parker goes from zero to 100,000 pair of glasses sold every year just through their buy one, you know, give one pair kind of idea. Simple content, $95, buy a pair of glasses, we'll give one to someone in need, and it's growing like crazy. And I think the Building a network of like real people who, as you empower them with content, will run with it is, um, is going to be the most powerful force. And we're seeing it with Xerox right now. That's an incredible video. I mean, congratulations on like a great video. You wouldn't expect from Xerox a few years ago. And now it's being taken to market by 160,000 employees and then vendors and friends of the company. And I think thinking in terms of networks and human networks is a really good way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and a question from the audience, actually, while we're talking about the video, it's for Krista. How do you distribute your video? Is there a strategy behind it, or did it just kind of take off organically? 
Well, I mean, obviously we had the social strategy and we have put some paid efforts behind that, but the deployment with our sales force and our employees, to your point, it really can't be, um, you know, underestimated here. It's pretty powerful when you put this in the hands of this many employees. So our distribution strategy is a little bit inorganic, but primarily organic. And this video doesn't have a shelf life. I mean, I keep telling people it's pretty evergreen. So my expectation is when I walk into a sales meeting with a client that my salesperson already has this teed up and it's part of the discussion. It works with investors. It works if I walk into an employee orientation session it should be there so we're really getting to the stakeholder relation people across the company and saying does this work for you and if so it's worth every dollar that we spend on it because um, the distribution has to be across every stakeholder group are, are you distributing it through traditional media at all no um, not traditional media right now although it the um, the heart of the concept there is informing the next generation uh, or the next rev of our brand campaign that we're looking at. So the messaging will be consistent in what we're doing with traditional advertising going Got forward. Yeah. Great. Well, we are out of time. Thank you guys so much for joining me up here. Thank you.